All right. For those who just joined us, welcome to today's webinar, NFPA and its implications on energized electrical inspections. My name is Doug Wagen. I'm with UE Systems. Uh, we're pleased to have Rob Miller here from IRIS to present today's webinar. You know, UE Systems is always looking for opportunities and looking for ways to, to bring more information uh, to the users of ultrasound technology. We recognize that, you know, you do more out in your plant from a, a condition monitoring and, a, and an inspection standpoint than just apply ultrasound technology. So, you know, what we look at is, is how do we fit in with an overall reliability program, an overall safety program, an overall energy program. So we're, we're constantly keeping our eyes peeled for the people we see in industry um, that can help our, our users and help our customers, uh, you know, better those programs. So one of the things that we, we've heard a lot of lately is people using ultrasound for electrical inspections, and it got us, got us thinking after we did a webinar a few months ago with uh, a colleague of Rob Miller's, uh, Martin Robinson at IRIS, that there's a lot to this NFPA and, and its implications on how to do safe electrical inspections of energized gear. Since a lot of you, our customers, are doing that, uh, we thought it'd be appropriate to bring you some additional information as sort of a follow-up to the, to the webinar Martin did several months ago. Um, and for those who, who are interested, this webinar will be available uh, afterwards on our website, probably within a few days after this webinar ends. Um, also, for, for those people who are logged in today, um, please feel free to ask questions. I'm not going to be able to, because of time constraints, get all the questions right to Rob during the presentation. I may be able to get a few to him, um, but rest assured all your questions will be answered you know, within a reasonable amount of time after the webinar is concluded. Uh, we'll get back to you by email and, and via, via the proper channels to get your questions answered. So just real quick here before we get started, a little bit about us for those who are, who are not real familiar with UE Systems. We've been around for 35 plus years, founded in 1973, got a large global footprint. In other words, our, our focus is always on customer support uh, and, and getting the, the technical resources to people that they need to use this technology more effectively. Uh, we've got offices all over the U.S., uh, as you can see by this slide, Mexico, Canada, South America, Europe, Asia, India, the Middle East. Uh, so again, we've really ramped up our global footprint to make sure that we're able to technically support all of you out out there in the field. Um, so how does actual, how does UE systems fit in? I mean, what do we do on energized electrical systems? Uh, just a couple of things that have, that have really been uh, coming to the attention of everyone over the last couple of years, and that's, you know, safety inspections. Before doing infrared inspections on enclosed switch gear that don't have infrared windows or ultrasound windows in the switch gear, um, you know, many people are applying ultrasound technology to scan around any air gaps or ventilation louvers to see if they hear any kind of an anomaly going on, uh, in which case they would de-energize that before they'd ever open the cabinet. So from a safety aspect, you know, we feel it's really important to do some scans. Um, also, inspection of energized switchgear using some type of a, of a window or using Iris's windows um, to see if there's actual issues and doing the analyzing. So we, we fit in there. And also there's some other applications for ultrasound on energized electrical gear, like inspection of transformers, insulators, you know, any kind of a energized electrical gear. We use ultrasound as a complementary tool to infrared. And I'm sure Rob at some point during the presentation will touch on you know, some of the different technologies that are used uh, to inspect energized electrical systems. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome Rob. We're going to turn the, the presentation over to him. He's got some great information for us. So welcome. Thanks for being here, Rob. Appreciate it. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for the opportunity. Basically, the, the presentation here is uh, NFPA and its implications on energized electrical inspections. Uh, the NFPA was founded, uh, I'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, basically, I work for a company called Iris. We manufacture infrared windows and ultrasound ports. And uh, we are in the business of, of selling them. But if you talk to pretty much anybody with the company, we're more uh, a safety provider. We, we, we try to make sure that everybody goes home at the end of each day. And uh, so if you look at what, what is an arc flash, uh, 
for those that, that aren't familiar with it, um, if you've ever seen one live and up close and personal, uh, it makes you really think about the things that we do every day. So looking at it, you've got, this is two conductors. When you, when you get a, uh, the arc, it's, it's about 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You get a hot air, the expansion, the intense light. Uh, aluminum or copper goes from solid to a vapor. It expands by about 67,000 times. Uh, basically, it's throwing out hot molten metal as shrapnel. It's like a bomb going off. Uh, you get a sound and a pressure wave, and actually the, uh, the sound will deafen you. And uh, if the sound level is, is, is enough, it can actually stop your heart, damaged internal organs. Uh, it's not necessarily the heat that gets a lot of people. There are massive burn injuries, and, and there is some, some very life-changing events that the, that the heat will give you, but really the sound and the pressure wave can take a, a switch gear that you know is solid. You could drive a truck into it and reduce it to just a hulk in, in thousands of a second. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the uh, incident pyramid. Pretty much uh, everybody's seen one of these at some point in time. Uh, the this was done back in 1931. Uh, pretty much everybody's seen it at some safety meeting somewhere or another, and uh, it's statistical. They took and they looked at the number of workplace accidents versus the uh, number of first aid cases, recordable injuries, disabling injuries, fatalities, and it. Pretty much you can look at it and say uh, for every 100,000 100, hazardous tasks, you'll have 1,000 first aids, 10 recordable, 10 disabling, and one fatality. So uh, OK, so in a Mary capsule. They, they modified it looking at the number of arc flash incidents and, and the number of uh, injuries and fatalities. And, and it's kind of hard to come up with those numbers because if somebody's hurt at work and, and they're disabled, part of the uh, company paying them for the, the damages and the suffering that they've done is they, they seal the records. It, it looks bad for the company. And so this is, this is uh, there's, a, there's a website you can go to to put in the information, but we think you know these numbers are, are fairly standard and accepted, but I think they could be much higher. So if you're looking at this, uh, 85 arc flash incidents, you're going to end up with uh, 20 burn injuries, six incurable burns over half of your body, and one fatality. So really, if you're looking at those numbers, you know for just general maintenance, environmental health and safety type incidents, a near miss. Fatality, you're looking at 10,000 to 1 versus with an arc flash, it's 85 to 1. For a disabling injury, 10,000 to 1 or 85. In 85 incidents, there's six that actually are disabled. And for a 1,000 to 1 injury to fatality for the environmental health and safety, you're looking at a 20 to 1 chance. So if you're involved in an arc flash incident, which one happens pretty much statistically in the U.S. every three to five hours, uh, one of those people out of 20 is not going to go home at the end of the day. And uh, that's, that's what drives us to, to do the things that we do. Uh, some of the testing you can do, uh, the different testing methodologies for energized and de-energized. Energized, you can look at your ultrasound, your ultrasonic infrared testing, current voltage, total harmonic distortion, your contact resistance, your long-term power monitoring. Um, De-energize, you can look at resistance, impedance, the contact resistance, ratio on, on the transformer, ground faults, uh, some of those things you just can't do, energized. Uh, looking at the energized testing, uh, infrared and airborne ultrasonic can be used as safety measures. So you can do your ultrasonic and infrared. They really should be done on the outside of the cabinets prior to opening. Um, one of the things that uh, Iris sells, of course, uh, not that I'm a sales guy, but uh, they sell the, the ultrasound ports. And uh, basically it lets you take a snapshot of what's going on inside that piece of equipment, check for arcing, crack, tracking, uh, corona, 
without having to open the panel up. You know, the only time you should ever open a panel up is to clean the inside of it. If you, if you keep it sealed and, and you're checking it with the technologies that are out there, there's not a need. So you're going to look for significant heating with the infrared. You're going to listen for high levels of arcing around the cabinet openings, cracks, and infrared windows can be considered to allow a view of the components safely. Introduction to the ultrasonic testing. Uh, ultrasonic, is, it's got variable frequency ranges. Uh, the ability to tune that instrument to a specific range in the field, you're out there and you can hear a compressor running in the background or the hydraulic package three floors up. Um, you can fine tune it and mask out that noise and actually hear what's going on inside that piece of equipment. Uh, it's above the level of human hearing, around 20 kilohertz. Energized and de-energized. Uh, there's many elements to a good program. Um, standardized approach for all your technologies. M maintains a visible and documented asset health status. One way of ensuring this is done is control all the aspects of your program. You want to have all the nameplate information. You want a single line diagram of your electrical distribution system. You'd be surprised how many facilities you go into and they just don't have a single line diagram of the electrical distribution system. And without that, how do you troubleshoot something when you have a fault? If, if you're looking at a, a, this MCC is fed from here, what else is fed from there? How do you isolate something in case of a fire? And, and there's a lot of facilities that just don't have the basics. Copy of all your current inspections. When was the last time your gear was inspected? When was the last time the, the breakers were tripped for maintenance and, and they were lubed and they were assembly? But there's a lot of mechanical parts to it. And uh, if you don't take care of them, the chances of that breaker tripping when it needs to, they go down exponentially. Uh, schematics for short circuit and uh, coordination study data. Basically, uh, you're going to do an arc flash survey. You know, before. If you look at OSHA and NFPA, they're saying that you have, before you can go in the prohibited approach boundary, uh, you have to have done your arc flash survey and you have to have a qualified person inside of there. Um, if your historical data isn't out there, you know, I, I've been to a lot of facilities where, you know, nobody knows. Well, this guy's been here for 30 years, go ask him, and what he remembers is what history you got. And so it makes it tough to say, well, we're going to do this program with all of this information without having the historical data. But if you never pick a starting point and say this is point zero, and from here on we're going to gather that information. And so as things are repaired, inspected, replaced, all that information gets gathered up. And you know the best way to do that, digital camera. You go out there and you don't have to write down all the nameplate data. Take a picture of it. And the, the UE, the 15,000, it actually has one built into it. So when you go out there and you're, and you're running your route, you take a picture of the nameplate data and the asset so that when you're back in, in an office instead of out in the field, you have that information. Uh, the advantage of ultrasonic testing, you can detect arcing, tracking, and corona without a direct line of sight. The ultrasound waves are directional locatable, and they do not pass easily through solid objects, making shielding possible in a noisy environment. Uh, you can identify issues with equipment that can't be opened or accessed, like a bus duct, uh, circuit breaker, switch gear. A lot of those new switch gears that they're coming out with now are metal clad, and so there's an absolute wall. It's made that way so that if there was an arc flash or an arc blast, that the, the blast is vented up out the top of the panel and not at the person standing in front of it. Well, that makes it tough for a line of sight uh, technology. You can't see it. There's a there's a wall only. Now you will see the heat plume, and you can determine that there is a problem there. But by the time you see a a degree or two rise in that metal clad, it could be 250, 300 degrees on the backside. So it gives you a early indicator. Uh, it gives you it gives you a go no go, and that's what non destructive testing is all about ascertaining the asset's health without interrupting production, and this gives you a way of doing that. I don't... So, ultrasonic testing finds critical issues that might be missed with, test with infrared alone, such as insulation deterioration inside of a, con a conduit. 
This was at a three-year-old oxygen plant on the several sets of 5,000 volt motor leads. Ultimately, this insulation would have failed. You can see where the insulation inside the conduit was arcing. The, the picture on the left here, those are burn marks. And then when you pull it out, it was, it, the insulation was just deteriorating. And, and there's no way, you, by the time you saw it with infrared, you would have had a major problem. Ultrasound picked this up ahead of, ahead of the game. Uh, correct analysis of your recordings. One of the things that the, the 10,000, the 15,000, even the 9,000, you can record your readings when you're out in the field. And uh, like in the old days when everybody started out in vibration, you carried around a reel-to-reel a -reel tape deck, telling how old I am, and uh, you recorded all of the things that you, uh, you only recorded those problems that needed further analysis. You made a judgment call on the spot. Well, as that was with a single channel analyzer that I needed a two guys or a forklift to push around. Uh, you can get a four channel analyzer that basically is the size of an iPhone these days and you record everything because digital media has taken storage capacity through the roof. And so ultrasonics the same way. You can take a, a card, slip it in your 15,000, go out there and record everything you look at. So when you get back, you load it into the DMS software and you can trend it. You can see what it was last month versus the month before versus the month before. It's not so much an art anymore. It's becoming a science. You don't have to have that tuned ear. You don't have to be the, the guru of the bunch. It's, it's being made to where anyone can, can get good results. And with the aging of our workforce, there are young people coming in and, and taking over jobs that were traditionally the, the more senior mechanic that's had his hands deep in this. And we took this gearbox apart twice a year because it was a PM. Well, we've gone away with from those PMs because we realized there wasn't value added to those. But the training that that mechanic had from taking that apart helped him to determine what it should sound like and when it was going to have a, a problem. And new maintenance technicians coming in, they don't get that experience. They don't take things apart. If it's not broken, you don't necessarily tear it apart. And so these types of technologies make it a lot easier. Uh, overall amplitude of the readings is not really as important as the change from your baseline. It's similar to the exception report that's utilized in all your other predictive technologies. And the rate of change can be used to determine the severity and how much time you have to plan the job before your next shutdown. And you can schedule that shutdown. This is a tracking that was found with ultrasonics. You know, you take it and you look at it, this thing would have failed. Uh, introduction to infrared. The definition of infrared is light waves outside the visible spectrum. It's a wave slightly longer than those visible to the human eye. Uh, the uh, diagram here on the right, you can see obviously a, a loose connection on the A phase. Uh, it's, the bread and butter of any thermographer. A uh, couple of different ones here. You can see, looking at the the resolution, you see the the bare footsteps walking up the walking up the steps here. It's not ghost hunters, and, and you know this is there was some some of the energy infrared, the the heat from the foot was imparted to the carpet. Uh, you see a pump seal. You can see a motor bearing, uh, just all examples of, of things you can see. It's a very visual medium. Uh, infrared, line of sight and cover removal. When it can be performed safely, all covers are removed to give you that direct line of sight. It's critical that the person removing those covers is qualified. They got to be familiar with construction and hazards of the equipment, and they have to wear the appropriate arc flash and shock protective equipment based on the risks associated with it. Transformer here. I've opened way too many of them that I never should have. Uh, if you look, the connections, all of these connections here, they're hot. And you know that cover, it doesn't necessarily have to fall out. It falls in, and you're in a, a world of hurt. So uh, another line of sight and cover removal. In this example, it's a main bus connection. You can only be seen by removing both the dead front covers to reveal. Looking at the distribution board, this is the outside. 
you've got the, the breakers here, you've got a, a dead front here. With the covers on, you can see that there's some heat, but it doesn't look any different than the fact that there's some load. And then when you take the one cover off, you still see a lot of heat, but not so much. So you take the cover off, this is what it actually looks like with the covers off. With all the covers off, you can see the loose connection. And then after the repair was done, this is, this is what you see. So removing the covers is not always a bad thing. But if you're going to remove covers, you have to be qualified. You have to know what it is you're doing before. And that's something that we don't have a lot of. Uh, NFPA, in its uh, changes, uh, is, is making sure that we're protected, that, that everyone that's... Uh, that everyone that is going to have to, their job is going to place them in that risk is, is qualified for it. And if, if not, that the, the employer is, is going to be fined for it. They're, they're giving out some big fines. Uh, infrared windows allow the technician to use infrared and using specialized infrared or ultrasonic ports test with airborne ultrasonic as well. Energized testing using power quality, voltage test, and current test isn't possible when you're looking through our infrared window. Uh, example here, it's a 60 amp single pole breaker, uh, 12 and a half amps, 6% total harmonics, and it's 32 degrees Celsius. You know, the, if you look on the front of those breakers, it actually has a, a little sticker on it that says square D 60 amp, and it says 40 degrees Celsius is what it's rated to. So if, if you don't know what you're doing, you haven't been trained, you can walk right by that with the cover on and go, yep, that's okay. You know, there's no deficiency. You take the cover off, uh, without the covers off, uh, the inspection, you really can't get a good look at it. So you take the covers off. Oh, and I think I'm missing a slide there. With the cover off, that was a very loose connection that would have burned into. I think I'm missing a slide there. Uh, infrared windows are your, another solution. Uh, if you can't remove the panel due to safety reasons, there's an interlock that requires the system to be de-energized or something that you're going to look at on a routine basis. Uh, an infrared window makes a lot of sense. Uh, as this is an actual problem seen through an infrared window. Uh, it's a fuse and uh, the top connector. Uh, Ten days later, it's gotten exponentially worse. The camera isn't even able to adjust to uh, compensate. So it, it was too hot for the, for the camera. The, the temperature range on the camera didn't go high enough to see how hot this was. Uh, and with the window in place, it was able to be found, uh, a generator brought in, the incoming power taken off, the fuse replaced, and uh, production was able to go un, un inhibited by this fault and without it it would have been a, an absolute failure. Uh, the electrical contact, surf contact surfaces are a much more common failure point than the conductors. I mean that makes sense where you, where you bolt them together, where you uh, crimp on a connector. Those are the problems. You know the, the long stretch of wire that comes off a machine and is quality controlled. You'll see one here and there that has an issue and that most of that is on in the installation but uh, they, they don't tend to fail. So the, the weak point is going to be wherever you have to make your terminations. Uh, some of those uh, examples that uh, most of you that have ever looked through an infrared camera are familiar with, these are your loose connections, you know, things that, that stand out from the norm. You can look and see you know, there's an obvious problem with this. And, and that's the low-hanging fruit that makes, uh, makes it easy for infrared as a visual media to uh, show the bang for the buck. Question here is high resistance electrical connections. How many of your electrical connections are there that carry the balance of the production ability in your facility? Yeah, everybody knows you got a 3,000 amp breaker that feeds the, the this area of the plant or you know you got a you everybody knows the big things and, and, and most facilities, I won't say all, but most facilities, you look into them every every year, every couple of years. You know, you know, you have to do that kind of testing and cleaning. But how many, how many 12 gauge wires 
are in control circuits that can shut down the entire process because it's interlocked. What's the what's the loss of production due to just raw materials that were in the process when the power went out? You know, what what are those costs? And so um, you look in some examples here. How many different connections are there in, in, in that MCC? How many fuses are there? That a loose connection burns up and it shuts something down and that, that kills the whole process. Uh, when you think about it, statistically, uh, there's tens or thousands, tens of thousands connections and they carry the balance of the plant and we don't actually inspect them. We, we assume. I mean, I've spent a lot of holidays Thanksgivings, Christmas, Fourth of July's, working in a plant somewhere, checking every connection to make sure it was tight. Back in the day, that was how you did it. Now you do an infrared scan. Well, when I started with infrared scans, you don't break the plane. Take all the covers off. You open all the doors. You just don't break the plane. And if you really look at it, the way NFPA and OSHA are going now, uh, OSHA 1910333 says basically there's only two times you should ever open an electrical cabinet hot and one is if shutting it off shuts off critical ventilation or there's just no other way you're troubleshooting and you need to see the voltage you know just saying that we need to we need to do it because it makes financial sense it doesn't it doesn't fly anymore they're, 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 those days are done uh, so NFPA the National Fire Protection Association they were established in 1896 uh, the world's leading advocate of fire prevention, lots of codes and standards. They're pretty much the experts, and uh, if they're not, they are in collaboration with the people that might be considered the expert in another field. Um, I've been in several different industries uh, where other NFPA standards were equally as important. Uh, um, National Electric Code, NFPA 70E. Uh, NFPA 70B, which is the recommended practice for electrical equipment maintenance, and NFPA 70E, which is your standard for electrical safety in the workplace. We'll go through each one of those a little. National Electric Code, pretty much everybody knows or has heard of. Uh, it was done by the insurance, architectural, electrical, and allied interests. It gives you your design, your installation, your inspection. It doesn't address maintenance. It doesn't address workplace safety. It's how many conductors can go in this piece of conduit. If you're going to have a 50 amp load, what size conductor does it have to be? Where do the receptacles have to be in relationship to? Uh, everybody pretty much has to follow it. You get inspections before you start anything up. 70B, that's your recommended practices. Okay, so you went through and you installed everything the way they said. You know, you got this high of a load. Uh, you got this many conductors. And 70B is how you maintain that. If you, if you look at mechanical and electrical systems, electrical systems, they either work or they don't. You get people that say, you know, why should I, why should I do this inspection? This switchgear has been running for 30 years and we've never had a problem. Well, it was designed right. It was installed right. People can't get away with halfway putting something together. You can, you can make a case for if the mechanical design was done to the standards of the National Electric Code, you wouldn't have all the mechanical issues either. But 70B basically makes sure that, as dependable as it was put in, that it's maintained in, in, a, in a manner that keeps it that dependable. It gives you your maintenance practices. Uh, 70B, uh, it's your recommended practices. The committee was established in 68. Uh, it was done to address preventative maintenance, as some people say preventive. Uh, electrical systems and equipment used in industrial applications with the view of reducing loss of life and property. Uh, 2006, so there was 40 years almost in there, they started uh, another edition and they had an enhanced focus on safety, talked about baselines and how to apply your reliability center maintenance because those were becoming mainstream. Then again, 2010, a new edition, reorganized. Uh, grouped related topics, added some new material for emergency preparedness, electrical system, and equipment restoration. Uh, recommendations on how to conduct outsourcing for your maintenance, and information on your failure modes. There's a new addition 
coming out in 2012, actually October of this year, and it's got a lot of changes. So you can see it was uh, almost 40 years between the first and the second edition, and then four years between the second and the third edition, and uh, two years between the third and fourth. And uh, it really is in the forefront. It is something that is driving the industry. Uh, it's something that without a knowledge of it, the the fines still come, and 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 people are ignorance is is not an excuse. Uh, that's why so many of you are here today. I'm sure. Uh, chapter four describes how your effective electrical preventative maintenance program pays dividends. You know, dependability can be engineered and built into the equipment, but the maintenance is required to keep it dependable. So. Electrical equipment deterioration, that's normal. Any, any piece of equipment from the day you install it, it's failing, slowly but surely. Uh, it doesn't have to, f as soon as the new, new equipment is installed, you know, you know that it starts deteriorating, so you plan around that. You plan your maintenance program. You identify the factors that will cause the deterioration, and you come up with a, a plan, provide a measure to, to deal with them. The well-administered preventative maintenance program reduces accidents, saves lives, minimizes costly breakdowns and unplanned shutdowns, and it's a form of protection. It protects the facility from a lawsuit, it protects the work from uh, a life-changing event, loss of, loss of their livelihood, loss of limbs, and, and lost profit. Uh, if the plant's still running and, and the equipment never fails, the company can meet its production goals. Chapter 11, which used to be Chapter 21, uh, infrared inspections of electrical systems are beneficial to reduce the number of costly and catastrophic failures and unscheduled shutdowns. Uh, infrared reduces the typical visual inspections and the tedious manual inspections and are especially effective in long-range detection situations. Basically, all of those holidays that I missed watching my kids uh, tightening up every nut, bolt, and screw and control cabinets and switch gear, I could have spent at home if we'd had infrared windows and cameras as cheaply as they are available now. Uh, so 70B says the testing and test, mes test methods uh, can be up to quarterly where it's warranted. If, if you have some, uh, a piece of equipment that your experience has shown that you have a, a problem before a six-month window, you might have to do it quarterly if it's new. We just installed it. It's brand new. It should be cadillac -ing. But you should actually check it three months later just to see if everything's breaking in the way it was. Is there a problem before it burns up? The infant mortality that we are in gearboxes and car tires and things is that works for electrical distribution systems too. If the environment changes. So we, we put a switch gear in and uh, it's in this nice enclosed room and all of a sudden, somebody decides they need to run a line from the air compressor room, which is right next to it, and they knock a big hole in the wall. You know that you're getting dust from another process in there. You need to take a look more often than you used to. Uh, if your operation or your load changes, well, we, were, we used to run 60% because we only had this many uh, orders, and now things have ramped up and we're running 102%. You might need to look at your electrical distribution more often. It also calls for the maximum possible loading uh, during the inspections, and uh, they say open for a direct view of the components, but they also all call, uh, 70B, 70E, and OSHA 1910, all call for an electrically safe work condition whenever possible. So 70E is your standard for electrical safety, which most people will say it tells you what PPE you got to wear. It's not really a PPE document. It, uh, the committee was established in 76. It was there to assist, assist OSHA in developing electrical safety standards. And in 2007, OSHA stated that it will draw heavily from aspects of 70E and, and, and the National Electric Code in a rare revision of 1910-03 subpart S. Basically, the, the take that from everyone that I know that sits on these committees is the fact that uh, it wouldn't be 
efficient and they would create too many loopholes for OSHA to regulate a lot of these things and NFPA 70E to regulate these things because one or the other of them is going to be not as fresh, not as new, not as restrictive and so it provides a loophole for people to get around doing what they should do. So OSHA has defaulted and said that 70E is a national consensus standard. Uh, it's not the standard that tells you to use PPE. It's a standard that says energized electrical conductors and circuit parts to which an employee might be exposed shall be put into an electrically safe work condition before an employee works within the limited approach boundary. Uh, that's your fundamental principle on which 70E is based is that you have to control risk wherever it is practical. Eliminate the hazards, reduce the risk in the design phase, apply all the safeguards, implement administrative controls, and use your PPE. Your approach boundaries, it's kind of like an onion. That's the way I've always described it to people, it's like an onion. You have your different layers and in between you have your, your spaces. Uh, your flash protection boundary is your, uh, oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself here. Your flash protection boundary is uh, the approach limit at a distance from the exposed live parts within which a person could receive a second degree burn if an arc flash were to occur. Uh, basically there's three ap shock approach boundaries. Uh, you got your limited, your restricted, and your prohibited. The prohibited approach boundaries are based on the voltage of the energized equipment. Uh, limited, restricted, and prohibited, sorry. Uh, also, NFPA 70E requires before a worker approaches exposed electrical conductors or circuit parts that have not been placed in a work condition, a flash hazard assessment should be performed. Basically, a pre-job hazard. Uh, until the equipment is placed in a safe work condition, it's to be considered live. So even if you've shut the power off, until you go in there and you take a meter and you verify that that voltage is gone, you have to you have to do the assessment. You have to suit up uh, until the equipment is placed in a, in a dead, uh, verified condition. Uh, they're considered live, and uh, flash hazard analysis should determine the protection level and the level of the PPE that the worker has to wear. The flash protection boundary is based on voltage, the available fault current, and the time it takes for the upstream protective device to operate and clear the fault. Uh, the limited approach boundary is a shock protection boundary to be crossed by only qualified persons, certain distance from a live part, which is not to be crossed by unqualified persons unless they're being escorted by a qualified person. So if there's a, a reason that the plant engineer who doesn't have the training with the PPE needs to actually see how bad is this? Can we fix it? Can we you might need to make a judgment call? He has to have an escort to go inside of this boundary. And and until you've done your arc flash survey, there are some generalities in 70 E that you can use, but they're a fallback and they tend to be more restrictive than you would think in some instances. Uh, an arc flash survey is something that without which uh, it's going to be really hard to continue to do business as normal. Uh, the qualified person has to use the appropriate PPE and they have to be trained to perform the required work to enter the space. A restricted approach boundary is that boundary which due to its proximity to the shock hazard requires the use of shock protection techniques and equipment when crossed. To cross the restricted approach boundary in a restricted space, the qualified person who's completed the required training must wear appropriate PPE. They also must have a written approved plan for the work that they'll perform and plan the work to keep the parts of their body out of the prohibited space as much as possible. This boundary is uh, again based on the voltage of the equipment and determined from NFPA table 2.1.3.4 in the 2000 edition. Uh, the prohibited approach boundary is a shock protection boundary that should only be crossed by qualified persons, which when crossed by a body part or object requires the same protection as if direct contact is going to be made with your live part. If you're going to 
go into the prohibited approach boundary, you have to be as suited up and protected as if you were going to grab a hold of the conductor. Only qualified personnel wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment, having specified training to work on energized conductors, and a documented plan justifying the need to perform the work can cross the boundary and enter the prohibited space. Therefore, personnel must obtain the risk assessment, and the boundary is determined uh, by NFPA 70E and on the voltage of the equipment. When is 70E applicable? Whenever workers are going to be exposed to energized electrical conductors or circuit parts, whenever there's a risk increasing behavior like opening panels, uh, taking covers off. Uh, if there's ever a reason to believe that equipment could experience a sudden change in state, well, we've had problems with this breaker trip, and so we're going to go in and take a look. Well, you know that this thing is changing state. It's not in a steady state operation. You know that is something that is, you know, defined. When is 70E applicable? When the energized work is not possible, you have to fill out a work permit, energized electrical work permit. Can be performed within the restricted boundary. Exception can be made for testing, troubleshooting, voltage measurements, and for visual inspections outside of that boundary. But unless those measurements need to be done in a fully loaded uh, condition, it just doesn't make sense. It's it's not worth your life. Uh, you have to document your shock hazard analysis. You have to document your arc flash hazard analysis. And you have to document the required PPE. Basically, that's why everybody hires somebody in to do an arc flash survey. And they come in and they put some nice little stickers on the wall, and um, everybody thinks, you know, that's the end of it. And every time you perform that maintenance on those breakers, that, that yearly maintenance, that arc flash assessment changes possibly. What's the clearing time for the breaker? That makes a huge difference in, in, in what the protective equipment needed is. So looking at 70 Metal clad switch gear, 1 to 38,000 volts. If you're removing bolted covers, it's considered exposed, risk increasing, and a hazard risk for. Uh, opening hinge covers, yes for exposed, yes for risk increasing, and hazard risk 3. Uh, circuit breaker operation with the closure doors open, yes, it's exposed, yes, you're increasing your risks, and it's a hazard risk 4. With the doors closed, no, you're not exposed. Yes, it's increasing your risk, and you still have a, a hazard or risk factor of two. Thermography outside the restricted area is considered exposed. It's not considered risk increasing. But you still have to wear hazard risk three. Reading a panel meter while operating that meter switch, it's not exposed. It's not risk increasing. You read the meter. So if you actually look at it, uh, the same industrial uniform that most people wear, what you would wear in any other portion of the plant, you can pretty much wear to read a panel meter. So looking at your hazard risk category zero, uh, basically walking around in a facility, non-melting, non-flammable materials, untreated cotton, wool, rayon, or silk, or any blends of those, fabric weight of less than uh, four and a half ounces per yard squared, uh, minimum arc rating, it's not required to be arc rated. So uh, level zero, reading a meter. Uh, level one, you have to have uh, right now an arc rated flame retardant shirt and flame retardant pants or flame retardant coveralls with a minimum of four cal. Uh, in the new edition of 70E that's coming out, uh, flame resistant, flame retardant is going away. It's going to just say arc rated shirt, arc rated pants, arc rated coveralls. And I, I think it increases the uh, the cost of the garments maybe a little bit, but it ensures that people that are going to be doing electrical work are prepared and, and protected. Uh, level two is our created shirt, pants, or coverall with eight cal. Uh, level three is shirt, and pants, or coverall. Arc flash suit selected, so the system arc rating meets the required minimum of 25 cal. Level four is arc graded shirt and pants or a coverall, or and a suit selected, so the system arc rating meets the required minimum of 40 cal. And uh, it's 
It's no fun working in one of those. If you haven't done it, I think everybody should try it. The collective experience of this task group is that in most cases, closed doors don't provide enough protection to eliminate the need for PPE. For instance, where the state of the equipment is known to readily change. Doors being open and closed, racked in or out. Uh, basically, you know, just the fact that you're leaving the doors closed doesn't mean that you shouldn't have on some PPE. You get people that say, well, we'll sell you some windows and uh, you don't have to wear your PPE anymore. Really, that's not the case. It's a good selling point. You can sell a lot of windows that way. But honestly, it just means you minimize the amount of PPE you needed. Uh, the 2012 edition of 70 is going to be available for purchase this October. All of the changes. Look at how OSHA interacts and interprets 70E. Occupational Health and Safety Administration enforces electrical safety regulations in the United States. Although OSHA has not adopted and does not mandate 70E compliance, you can be cited for non-compliance. How is that? Uh, what's a consensus? Consensus is a process for group decision making. It's a method by which an entire group of people can come to an agreement. The input and idea of all the participants are gathered and synthesized to arrive at a final decision acceptable to everyone. Through consensus, we're not only working to achieve better solutions, but also promote the growth of the community and trust in the document. 70E is considered a national consensus standard and as such non-compliance leave employers open for citation under Section 29 Code of Federal Regulations 1910.2G if they're found not to be in compliance. OSHA's authority to cite a company or an individual stems from the Occupational Safety and Health Act, in particular Section 5A1, which is your general duty clause in 29 Code of Federal, Regula Code of Federal Regulations 1910.2. Section 5A1, your general duty clause, states that employers shall furnish to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to the employees. This is the cause most cited by OSHA where unsafe work conditions are found. 29 CFR 1910.2G states a national stand, consensus standard is any standard or modification thereof, which has been adopted and promulgated by a nationally recognized organization under procedures whereby it can be determined that persons interested and affected by the scope or provisions of the standard have reached substantial agreement on its ado adoption. Consequences. Okay. This is uh, some examples of where OSHA has fined people. Uh, the Postal Service in West Virginia got a $287,000 fine for exposing workers to electrical hazards. Maryville, Ohio firm fined 91500 following an OSHA investigation. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island, OSHA charged the United States Postal Service again with 12 willful and serious safety violations in order to pay fines of $558,000. That's a lot of stamps. OSHA finds an Ohio company $60,000 for failing to train in safe work practices and failing to require workers to wear the PPE when working in electrical panels. Orwell, Nebraska, a biofuel company, they were cited $60,000 for safety violations after one of its workers was fatally electrocuted. Columbus, Ohio scrap metal firm fined 64,014 safety violations. Twelve of the safety violations classified as serious, and they were all covered by NFPA 70E. So if you're going to work with infrared windows installed, working with an ultrasound port installed, it removes your high-risk behavior, maintains a closed and guarded condition, fully loaded inspections, access to previously prohibited gear, the, efficient, the surveys are very efficient. Uh, you control your risk to both your personnel, your plant, and your process, and you eliminate better than 99% of your art triggers. It uh, gives you safe access to your components, minimizes your manpower, minimizes your PPE. Uh, you can increase your ROI and avoid arc flash triggers. Well, that was interesting. 
pardon the interruption there. See if we can't get this right back where we were. Okay, I seem to be having some technical difficulties here. Let me jump in here and see if we had any questions from the group. Uh, hey Rob, we did have a couple of questions here from the group. If you give me just a second here, I'll read a couple of questions, see if I can get you to answer them. Uh, one of them is, why is NFPA charging for regulations that will be applied as OSHA requirements? Um, basically, the NFPA is a uh, nonprofit organization, and uh, I've actually talked to a lot of the people over at the NFPA, and because uh, I had the same question. I mean, if you're going to make me have to, to apply by this standard, shouldn't you give it to me? And uh, basically, the, the cost for the standard uh, what they're charging is is basically what it costs them to come up with it. It's it's not funded by the government. It's not a uh, government entity. NFPA is is a a non for profit organization that they're they're not charging it to make money. They're just keeping themselves afloat. Okay. Here, here's another one I've got here. Uh, Rob is is opening a breaker panel considered exposing personnel to live energy? Yes. As, as long as it's as long as it's energized, okay. If you're opening the, if you're opening the panel up, absolutely. Okay. I think I think I got my technical uh, issue solved. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, have you got any, anything else we need to jump in on, or I, I'm pretty close to done. Okay. I, another I quick comment. Short on time, but another quick comment. Um, the presentation for those interested will be available next week uh, on our website on uesystems.com. Okay. Uh, creating your collaboration. You're going to have uh, your safety professionals. They got a skill set, safety management system, risk management, human error. You got your technical experts, the guys that are used to taking these panels apart. And then you got management who's really on the hook if, if production's uh, interrupted. They're they're the ones on the hook, and you've got to get those people working in conjunction. It can't be that well. We need you to do this inspection, but we can't stop the plant. Or it can't be that the safety guy is well. This can't happen without shutting the plant down. There has to be com some consensus, and you have to get everyone on board on the front side, so that you can have the argument about how bad does a a problem have to be while everyone's calm, cool, and collected, and there's not the balance of the plant hanging either about to catch on fire according to the technician or about to be unsafe because of the safety personnel or about to interrupt production. So there's no stressors in the group. And discuss it in a calm, civilized manner and say, okay, look, when we get to this point, we're going to shut the place down whether the production needs it or not. If, if we get to this point and it's a safety problem, we're going to have those arguments on the front side. Uh, you've got a lot of different uh, resources, 70E, 70B, IEEE, uh, NIDA, UL standards. You've got to just take a critical look at your approach to maintenance. Uh, is it aligned with your organization's dependence on uptime? If you've got a lot of plants and it doesn't matter whether they run 24-7, shut everything down and work on it. If you're pushed and, and all the production you can possibly make is already sold and out the door and ready to go, you can't shut everything down. So how are you in line with your practices and, and do they meet up with what OSHA and NFPA standards are? Take it one bite at a time. Standards like 70s, uh, Canadian Standard 462, 70B, they're all there to help you build the framework for a successful and safe electrical maintenance program. Uh, while some of these processes are time consuming, required a discipline and determined management team, to ensure their implementation, uh, they're, they're worth it in the end. 90% uh, of your programs, they've got the right design. They just fail because pe people don't implement them consistently. Uh, outside resources, they, they make a lot of sense. You don't have to train people. You don't have to send them to school. You don't have to you know, pay their benefits. You can get them to come in, set up your 
electrical preventative maintenance, have them come in and do the infrared scan, have them come in and do the ultrasonics. They let them start the program off and then turn it over to the internals so that you've already got an established return on the investment. It's a whole lot easier to convince somebody to uh, put more time and more labor into a program when you're seeing end results. And create that extraordinary collaboration that we talked about. The rewards benefit every area of the business, especially the bottom line. In conclusion, companies looking to improve their profitability, uptime, and safety should study the recommendations in 70B and 70E. And it's significant that the standards value the use of the condition-based monitoring tools and techniques as the critical part of their maintenance program. Uh, the people that are writing these standards realize that it's a whole lot safer and it's a whole lot more effective use of your money to employ infrared, to employ ultrasonics, to make that judgment call. You know, they're saying this makes more sense than shutting the plant down for a week and tightening up every bolt. Not only that, but you end up with better results. Uh, NFPA and OSHA both agree electrical switch here should never be open to less de-energized. If you got any questions, you can go to iris.com. We've got a uh, little book, 10 things you need to know about infrared windows. Uh, it's free. You just sign up, give them your name, email address, and we'll send you a link to it. And I think we covered some of the questions, but in case there was any others, I've got one more here for you, Rob. A uh, chart on hazard levels was for 1 kV to 38 kV. How does this compare to less than 1 kV? Actually, if you look at your arc flashes, excuse me, <coughs> if you look at your arc flashes, some of your more severe uh, risk assessment, if you go through and do a lot of the math, uh, less than 1 kV tends to have higher risk categories because the uh, tripping time of the upstream protection device isn't as fast. Your 480 volt breakers a lot of times are category fours, whereas your 4160s aren't. They, they end up being not as, not as highly rated. So the, the lower voltages can be higher risk hazards. And, and that was just one chart that was pulled out of there. Uh, in 70E, there's, there's quite a few charts. It's a, it's a book. It's, it's not a pamphlet. Okay, uh, great. Thanks, Rob. The, for, for those of you who didn't get your questions answered live on the air here, we're going to be emailing you uh, the answers to those questions. Um, Rob, do you want to give everybody your email address? Um, yeah, uh, anyone that has any questions um, directly for me, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, my email address is r, as in Rob, dot Miller at uh, iris. Dot com that's i r i s s and uh, I would be I'll I'll do what I can to find out the question I'm, I I won't say that I know the answer right off the top of my head but I know where to go to get it so fantastic thanks for being with us this afternoon Rob appreciate you taking time out to talk to to everybody a uh, couple other quick comments here you know certainly um, Rob has given you his email for some from questions specifically I would encourage everyone to go visit. Uh, iris.com. There's a lot of real good information uh, on their site regarding inspections with using both ultrasound and infrared. Uh, as always, you could visit UE Systems website, um, which is uesystems.com for application information on ultrasound, not just limited to electrical, obviously for leak detection, steam traps, bearings, uh, future training classes. Um, in addition to that, we've got another webinar coming up Next month, uh, look for August 17th. We've got another webinar, uh, which is the seven steps of RCM, which is uh, we're going to be welcoming Doug Plucknet from Allied Reliability to work with us on that webinar. So again, thank you all for attending. Appreciate your time, Rob. Everybody have a great day and have a safe day. Take care.